Good morning, and thank you for joining us on this SAG After live stream on YouTube. To stay informed about all of our live stream and video events, we invite you to subscribe to this channel. You can go ahead and do that right now. Today, we present the President's Task Force on Education Outreach and Engagement live stream, the 411 on Intimacy Coordinators. We'll be pausing throughout as we have with us Destiny Bradford and Gabe Gomez, who are here today to translate the presentation into American Sign Language. Destiny and Gabe will be switching off periodically throughout today's discussion, and we thank them for their excellent service. The presentation will begin momentarily. If you have questions that you'd like to direct to today's guests, please email pteoe at sagaftra.org. That's pteoe at sagaftra.org. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and you can watch the replay right here on SAGAFTRA's YouTube channel, along with more great content. Now, please give a very warm welcome to today's host, SAGAFTRA President Gabrielle Carteris. Thank you, Pamela. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the 411 on Intimacy Coordinators. Very exciting. We have a great discussion plan for you today. But first, before I go any further, I want to acknowledge sag -AFTRA's Executive Vice President, and along with our National Executive Director, David White, who's going to be co-hosting with me today. Hi, guys. How are you? Hi, Gabrielle. Looking so forward to this. Yes, I'm very, very exciting. It's been a long process. So our union's daily work has actually always been guided by a strong belief that our members' workplaces must be free of harassment and supported by our collective bargaining agreements and the law. So I cannot stress the importance of this enough. Feeling safe and comfortable at work is imperative for everyone. So you may have heard that the union recently unveiled several initiatives that empower every member to help us create a safer environment on the jobs. Today, we're here to chat with leading intimacy coordinators about how they're working to make nudity and intimate scenes safer and more comfortable for you, our members. And as part of this discussion, we're gonna spotlight SAG-AFTRA's new industry-wide accreditation for intimacy coordinator training programs and registry, specifically, focusing on what this means for members members as performers and also what it ultimately means for the productions themselves. As I said before, protecting the safety, security, and dignity of our members is absolutely central to our mission as SAG-AFTRA. It is the reason we're here and it drives everything, everything that we do. Our continued focus is to protect and empower the individual to give them voice. And frankly, protecting, protecting the well-being security and dignity of our members is the reason that SAG-AFTRA exists. So what is an intimacy coordinator or an IC for short? Intimacy coordinators play an important role on set. And for those of you who aren't yet familiar with the term or the work that they do, an intimacy coordinator is an advocate, a liaison between actors and production, a I guess you would call a, a movement coach and or choreographer in regards to nudity and simulated sex or other intimate scenes. Essentially, essentially, ICs are there to help performers navigate tricky scenes with the goal of helping them to feel protected and comfortable. There aren't currently enough ICs working in the industry right now. That is a problem. So as an institution, we made a commitment to you, our members as they started to share with us, as you shared with us your stories, that we could help to expand and standardize a role that was growing so that this job would not only expand, but have a bar of expectation and that it would be able to flourish and ultimately be embraced industry-wide at all times when needed. So having experienced qualified intimacy coordinators on set helps ensure SAG after members who are filming scenes with nudity or simulated sex hyperexposed work are able to work in a manner that maintains their personal and professional dignity while realizing the director's creative vision. There is a symbiotic relationship. ICs are really meant to help, never to hinder. So we're going to look deeper into this growing profession and we'll briefly discuss the new industry-wide standards for training, registration, and continuing education and intimacy coordinators, coordinators recently released by the union. We really want the meat of today's conversation to focus on how this benefits you and what it means. David. Thank you, Gabrielle. And of course, you've set this conversation up very well. 
Uh, welcome to everyone. We're so excited to be able to roll this out and explain this to our members. These are critical programs and they build and continue to build an ecosystem that strengthens the protections for our members. We've been working with intimacy coordinators since 2019, and that's important. This is a part of a collaboration with the leaders and the existing uh, group of intimacy coordinators who work already. This is to ensure that the union understands the nuances of the field, that as it evolves, that we are understanding how those protections that are provided for our members, and frankly, for everyone on set, how that actually rolls out, how intimacy coordinators work well with each of the voices that are on a set, certainly as advocates for our members, but also the need to work with directors, the need to work with crew, the need to work directly with producers. This is part of what we wanna make sure people understand as we describe intimacy coordination today. And we really wanna focus on this work that we're rolling out, which is the intimacy coordinator accreditation program and our registry, which are two very critical pieces to the ability of the community to expand and to flourish, which is our goal. The accreditation program is a program that allows potential new registrants, those who want to be intimacy coordinators, to have a better understanding of high quality training programs out there. And there are particular pieces that are involved in a training that ensures that someone is coming on to set, they're able to understand the process of storytelling, they have been trained in uh, critical aspects of protecting people who may have faced uh, trauma, uh, but certainly who are involved in intimate scenes where uh, missteps, harassment, trauma, all of that is available without proper guidance. So the accreditation program ensures that there are high quality programs out there that people are aware of them. And frankly, we have placed right from the start a sense of building the pipeline for people with an eye and a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we wanna make sure that you hear about that. We also have a registry that we are setting up and the registry will allow producers and others who are looking for intimacy coordinators, the more they understand the value that the position, the role provides to a production set, that they have a place where they can go to understand who's serious about being an intimacy coordinator versus just someone who may come in off the street and say that they want to do that. We have to, the industry has to have a way to be able to uh, detect and decipher who can I hire and who is safe to bring on set? So the accreditation program and the registry, these are the two things that we want to focus on today. We're really proud of this collaboration. It builds on the protocols that SAG-AFTRA put out in January of 2020. And again, it reflects a collaboration with those who already work in this field and with the leaders who we are gonna be introducing um, uh, today, we're going to be introducing during this conversation. So, thank you, David. You know, our industry actually, when you think about it, it's changed exponentially in the last five to seven years. Scenes of intimacy are everywhere. Everything we're doing is more explicit than ever before. That 36 years ago, when I started in my career, they did not exist, and I wish they had. So, Last year, sag after it took a huge step towards normalizing, as David was talking about, really normalizing and encouraging the use of intimacy coordinators in productions large and small. These professionals have proven to be effective in changing the culture while safeguarding the safety and security of our members as they work. sag afters accreditation program and registry that David mentioned is very exciting. We're gonna hear more about that. Um, but before we do, um, I just want to go and take a moment to share a bit of each of our uh, backgrounds of the two people that who are going to be speaking with us today. First, I'll start and then David, maybe you'll do the second one, is with Alicia Rodas. She pioneered the roles of intimacy coordinator in the United States. That's pretty amazing. Alicia works in the position of intimacy coordinator 
for film and TV work on projects including The Deuce, Watchmen, Plot Against America, Crashing, High Maintenance, The Undoing, and Lovecraft Country, amongst others. She is currently an advisor to Time's Up, sag after uh, Time's Up, sag after and serves as the official intimacy coordinator for HBO Studios, consulting on their policies and protocols, as well as training and vetting the ICs working on HBO productions. Alicia is the creative director for Intimacy Directors and Coordinators, which specializes in training performers and industry professionals to better approach intimate scenes, as well as training and certifying intimacy coordinators for film and int intimacy directors for theater. David. Yes, so such a powerful background. And Alicia is joined by Amanda Blumenthal. Amanda Blumenthal, the first intimacy coordinator in uh, Los Angeles, who is the founder of Intimacy Professionals Association, which trains and certifies intimacy coordinators. Additionally, IPA is the first agency in the world to specialize in representing intimacy professionals, including intimacy coordinators, trans consultants, and gender and sexuality consultants with expertise in subjects such as BDSM, kink, LGBTQIA plus topics, including non-binary and gender non-conforming identities and other areas. As a leader in the work of, int of intimacy work, IPA is able to connect producers and productions with professionals who are appropriately matched to their project. Amanda is an experienced intimacy professional and is passionate about creating safe spaces on set in which actors can do their best work. Prior to her career as an intimacy coordinator, she worked as a sex and relationship coach. Amanda completed advanced training in the Somatica method and provided clients with a unique therapeutic experience that combined verbal and somatic processing. She is a trauma aware and kink friendly professional and uses this expertise to inform her work as an intimacy coordinator. Amanda, has coordinated hundreds of intimacy scenes on shows including Euphoria, The Affair, The L Word, Generation Q, The L Word, Generation Q, Carnival Row, Sorry for Your Loss, How to Get Away with Murder, The Voyeurs, and For All Mankind. Just an incredible background, and you can see the diversity of the backgrounds of folks who get into this field and who are good at it, which is something that's important for the industry to understand and uh, helps to flesh out this field. Thank you. You know, David, before we actually go to Alicia and Amanda, I would like to uh, introduce Michelle Bennett, who's actually been uh, the lead staff person in terms of helping with the accreditation and registry. Uh, so she can give us a little bit of a background on what it looks like, and then we can go into some uh, questions and conversation. Yes, I think that's great. And Michelle Bennett is our executive director of governance, a person of many talents who has shepherded this, shepherded, shepherded this program for us and has been working directly with intimacy coordinators. So without further ado, Michelle, let's turn this over to you. Great, thank you, David. So how did all this great work begin? Well, in, next slide, please. Well, in 2000, 19, the union announced a joint initiative to ensure productions are kept safe during nudity and simulated sex scenes for all talent and personnel. We had three objectives. Through our member-driven bargaining process, we wanted to update our relevant policies for nudity and simulated sex. And in partnership with the working community of intimacy coordinators, we wanted to help define the roles and protocols for intimacy coordinators on productions, and then specify training and vetting of intimacy coordinators. We were very thoughtful in how we were going to approach the initiative. It was really important that we work together as leaders of change and to use both internal and industry-wide outreach to achieve consensus on the standards. We also wanted to ensure that all voices in the industry are heard in a via collaborative process. The first step was to create standards and protocols for the use of intimacy coordinators. It was critical that we create a framework and system for when and how intimacy coordinators are used on set. 
And through our outreach and approach, uh, we were able to establish the support of our industry partners and allies. The next natural step was to create recommended standards for qualifications, training, and vetting of NMSC coordinators. And we accomplished this through meetings and surveys with groups and individuals that were top of the field, in the working community, and those with limited or no experience who were aspiring to become NMSC coordinators or trainers. We had many discussions uh, that were held to address concerns in the development in the concerns raised in the development of the standards, to understand different perspectives, and to set a bar of safety as the profession continues to grow. Ultimately, we designed a two-part approach as David outlined earlier. We have an accreditation system for training programs that includes a mandate for equity and inclusion and a registry where candidates provide work, proof of work experience and training with an added component of continuing education. The accreditation system sets standards for training programs that include curriculum requirements, trainer experience, and an equity and inclusive inclusion training initiative. The registry serves as a resource for employers. It lets employers know that sag afters reviewed proof of work experience in the minimum days, proof of training, and conducted a background check. The areas of min minimum training listed here are what sag after believes a qualified professional intimacy coordinator should have. I'm just gonna pause here for a moment and then next slide. We also created a pre-registry system for those who do not yet meet the standard work experience requirements, but have met the proof of training requirements, have work experience in a minimum of 25 days, and have provided permission to, for a background check. These candidates will also be invited uh, to participate in our continuing education conference. An advisor group composed of intimacy coordinators from the working community will then oversee the implementation of these standards. As far as our timeline, um, submissions have opened uh, beginning May 1st and will close July 31st for the accreditation for training programs. And for the registry and pre-registry lists, submissions for applicants will begin on August 1st and close on October 31st. So in closing, the union is committed to ensuring a safer work environment. And these standards assure you as a sag after member that when you're on set with an intimacy coordinator, you are protected and advocated for by a professional qualified uh, individual, and that the intimacy coordinator has experience and training to handle a variety of situations in intimate and hyper exposed scenes. And you can expect consistent and quality intimacy coordination should you choose to perform in these scenes. And for more detailed information on the recommended uh, protocols and standards for use of intimacy coordinators and qualifications and training, please visit our website at sagafter.org slash intimacy coordinators. And that concludes the presentation. Gabrielle? That was great, Michelle. Thank you so much. And I really, it's been amazing work to work with you and with the other intimacy coordinators on this whole uh, project the last two and a half years. Um, so I think that this is a great time for us to really come into talking with Amanda and Alicia and, you know, these two and a half years, tell us a little bit, because I know I mentioned it, you know, Amanda, maybe you want to start with, tell us exactly what an intimacy coordinator is. I, I know I mentioned it, but talking about it as the work you do would be very helpful. Sure, happy to do so. So intimacy coordinators were introduced into the mainstream around 2018 and the job has evolved over the years. And essentially now what it is, is we are able to act as advocates and liaisons between actors and production in order to make sure that performers 
are able to give fully informed consent about what exactly is the expectation when it comes to doing nudity, simulated sex, other types of intimate content. Intimacy can be a lot of different things. It's not just purely exposing the body or performing simulated sex with another person or other people. Um, we're also able to act as a movement coach or a choreographer if that's something that a director would like assistance with. And I think a really key piece of this is acknowledging that not every director has the same needs and not every performer has the same needs. And so a really good intimacy coordinator is able to work with the production on an individualized and customized basis and, and work with them on what exactly is it that we can do to help support you through the process of working on an intimate scene. And so some directors and performers, they love choreography and others, that's not necessarily something that they need. So we work with productions to figure out where, where are the pieces that we can help support them. Um, there's lots of other ways that intimacy coordinators can help. We can act as advocates for LGBTQIA plus cast members and crew. Um, we also have specialized knowledge when it comes to things like modesty garments and barriers and making sure that performers are outfitted with the appropriate uh, garments and barriers whenever they're working in intimate scenes. Um, and we're also there to help make sure that the union's guidelines are being followed when it comes to intimate work. So making sure that the set is properly closed, making sure that performers have appropriate nudity riders in place um, that properly reflect what it is that they've agreed to do, making sure that the performers are informed about what are their options when it comes to intimacy scenes? What does it mean if we use a double? Um, what does it? What kinds of VFX can be used um, in, in terms of removing any sort of extra modesty wear that might be appearing on camera, things like that. And so the intimacy coordinator is really there to be a resource to performers as well as the production and just make sure that we're all on the same page so that everything can go smoothly when we get there to shoot. That's great. Amanda. I'm sorry, Gabrielle, you're going to... Go on, Pam. Go on, David. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. That was a comprehensive uh, response. Uh, Alicia, I want to ask you, so Amanda's just laid something out that if you are unaware of how this actually operates in, uh, in the real world, it seems like an intimacy coordinator is doing things that a director should be doing or that uh, the wardrobe crew should be doing. Give us a sense of how you work in partnership and extend the vision of a director, not get in the way. I know that these are questions that have come to both of you over time and that you're quite comfortable not only answering, but helping uh, people understand how attached directors that use you have become. So give the uh, let's give uh, the audience a sense of that. Sure, David. Um you know, and, and great question because, uh, you know, people can look at it from the outside and think that this could be something that easily could be stepping on toes of others. And to be honest, it's part of why the training and experience is so important with having an intimacy coordinator on set. Uh, we are liaisons, but we are also collaborators. You know, so a lot of the work that we are doing, I like to think of us as the connective tissue between all these different departments, the actors, the director, the ADs, to make sure that everyone is on the same page as Amanda put so, so well, and make sure that we are all communicating well. Um, and this is something that I've found with a lot of directors I work with. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on language. Some directors are having, aren't sure really how to put certain things and a, uh, a tool or a skill that an intimacy coordinator is bringing is the tool of language and different ways to communicate and also work with if there are any issues that are arising um, and there's a way to, uh, to resolve any sort of conflict that might be coming up between the different parties. Can I, I have a question because I, you know, we talk about the intimacy coordinator and being in this moment, but, you know, talk about a little bit just for background, just the origins of it and why, why we're seeing such expansive growth in this moment and the need for it. Sure. So it would be impossible. Well, there have been intimate scenes for a, as long as we've had film and television. <laughs> um, the, what types of intimate scenes have certainly varied. 
Uh, but in, uh, and certainly there are people that were brought on to help choreograph certain scenes at different times. But the idea of someone coming in as an advocate and a choreographer um, and someone to be working with everyone specifically on intimate scenes as the title of intimacy coordinator really only started in the past few years. Um, myself and a couple of other movement directors had started doing a bit of this work uh, in the past five to 10 years. And uh, some of this came from the theater, um, but also there are people that were working one-on-one -on, -one on some film sets as well. Um, so the, but as I said, the idea of this being both advocacy and uh, coordination, truly, because we are coordinating between different departments, uh, really started in the past uh, uh, five to seven years. Um, and the first time in the United States that there was an intimacy coordinator brought on a main series was on The Deuce, uh, which was an HBO production in season two. Um, and of course, you know, we, we cannot uh, <laughs> in, in good faith talk about how there is, was a surgence uh, of this happening without mentioning the Me Too movement. Because you know, we had started doing this work. I personally was working on a lot of indie sets um, and small projects doing this kind of work. And people would say, oh, that's a really good idea. We don't have the budget for it, or I'm not really sure about it. Um, but then the Me Too movement happened and or the resurgence of the Me Too movement at least. Um, and suddenly people started to realize that this was something that there had been issues in the past that we sort of had a reckoning with and had a reckoning of harassment um, in the, the major um, power dynamics that are at play, uh, certainly on film and television sets. So um, as I said, the first time that there was an intimacy coordinator brought on to a major US production was The Deuce in 2017 uh, for season two. And uh, after that, um, HBO was the first studio to mandate intimacy coordinators on every set after that. Thank you for that. I, I have to say, you know, one thing I wanna share is um, for me, I, you know, I had never, I said this 36 years ago, didn't even, I mean, just was never discussed. So it was always every person for themselves, right? You just kind of whatever. It was so interesting in this process working with you uh, both and actually all the intimacy coordinators that we've, as we've been working on the accreditation and the registry to shoot 90210, the reboot a uh, year and a half ago. And to have a director point blank come up to me and say, you know, would you like to have an intimacy coordinator? And which was so exciting because we had just been, we've been so deeply in the conversation. And I was so pleased to hear that, um, to be asked that question and to actually, uh, I asked her the question, how did you even get involved with this? She said, at first, when I was told on a show that it was actually a mandate of that particular show to have an intimacy coordinator, she said, I was appalled. I'm the director. I didn't want anybody to interfere. That was, uh, you know, I would, I didn't want it, but they said that was part of, you know, her responsibility being on the show. She actually said that it was freeing for her. It was freeing for the actors, but it was freeing for her and for the crew on the set. But she said it allowed her to know her actors were safe and that she could go and oversee everything and check in knowing that they were being heard and seen. So I just, I have to relay that to you and everybody here because it's so, so wonderful. Uh, oh, I'm, I, I'm so glad that you brought it up because that is what we continue to get is from directors and producers and actors is I thought this was going to be a headache. I thought this was going to be something to get in the way. But truly, this gave me freedom because I knew this is where our boundary was. So we had freedom to play within all of that. Well, people are asking for consent, right? I mean, the idea you're asking me if it's OK. I'm like, thank you for empowering me. Thank you for giving me voice and giving me choice. Anyway, go on, David. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I, I mean, I'm going to turn this over to you. And and frankly, I want to hear from both of you about uh, examples of where the role of intimacy coordinator really made a difference. I think it's it has been so helpful over the evolution of this process and in our work with you for us to really understand, okay, this is the kind of work that they are doing. It's not just a sex scene. So when we talk about uh, scenes of intimacy. Intimacy comes in lots of different ways through uh, someone uh, talked about a scene of pedophilia and someone had talked about the first kiss and uh, explain a little bit 
how this rolls out and, and the many different ways that uh, your role can help the actor, but also help uh, other members on the crew to deal with true intimacy that is occurring on a set. Yeah, absolutely. I think that what we have to remember always is that every actor brings their life experience with them when they go to work and when they go to set. And, you know, sometimes that life experience can get in the way of being able to show up fully at work, such as if someone has trauma in their background and they're being asked to participate in a scene that may be really triggering to that trauma. And it may not be a full, you know, nudity or simulated sex scene. It could be just making out in the backseat of a car and that could be really triggering for them because of their life experience. And so the intimacy coordinator is able to help um, shepherd someone through that experience and also help advocate for ways that they can take care of themselves and ways that they can approach the scene that make it tenable for them. Um, you know, other experiences that performers have where they say that intimacy coordinators are really helpful are like David mentioned, first kisses, especially between minors. Some people, they have their first experience ever kissing someone ever on camera. And that can be such an incredibly vulnerable experience. And so having someone there to help walk you through the process can be really useful. Same thing with, especially with performers who are doing um, intimacy on screen for the first time, whether that's simulated sex or nudity, they don't teach you in drama school or an acting class how to handle these kinds of scenes. They, your, your actors are taught almost nothing about it. And so it's kind of just this, this box, this like black box that they're like, I guess I'm gonna be doing this, but I don't necessarily know uh, much about it. And so having an intimacy coordinator there to help you and inform you about these are the standards when you know we're doing these kinds of scenes, this is what you can expect. So you're not showing up on the day you know, anxious about what's going to happen to me today. They know exactly what's going to happen. They know what to expect. We have conversations with everyone. So everyone feels really comfortable with what's going to be happening. Um, and there's, there's lots of different, you know, examples of, of types of scenes where having an intimacy coordinator is, is especially important. Um, and those are just a couple. Thank you. Um, you know, I have a question because we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And how do we talk about how this, it can be manifested through this work? Um, because it's so important. It's so prevalent in our conversations and everything that we're doing right now. And this is because it's a, a field that we're looking to grow. I know it's something that's on people's minds. So can you talk a little bit about that? Um, either Alicia or uh, Amanda can start. Sure. I mean, part of the training that someone has uh, in coming in as an intimacy coordinator um, is uh, uh, anti-sexual harassment training, anti-harassment training in general, but also um, EDI training, equity, uh, diversity, and inclusion training as well. Um, you know, I think it's it's very important to specify that an intimacy coordinator is not an EDI specialist, is not there for um, the the specific mental health of scenes like that, and that's why we are so passionate about um, bringing in other consultants. Uh, and you know, uh, I know that the Underground Railroad, which is um, uh, about to come up, had an entire mental health staff um, that was there along with an intimacy coordinator so that there were multiple um, different factions to go through uh, when dealing with really highly sensitive material. But in general, you know, having an intimacy coordinator on set really tends to elevate the entire set to a point that people know that there is, um, there is understanding, there is reasoning, there is um, someone there to make sure that there is safety on set. And what we find is that some of those jokes, some of those offhanded comments, some things that people might say in really thinking that they are lightening things up or making things more um, uh, uh, relaxed, which can, also, which can end up actually having the opposite effect. You know, having an intimacy coordinator there tends to help uh, bring everyone, uh, elevate the set to uh, how people are interacting with each other as well. I want to be very clear. Thank you uh, for that. Listen, this issue of inclusivity and equity is something that's really critical to SAG-AFTRA. We have a number of 
uh, programs and a number of efforts to actually push this throughout the industry. We're focused on our union, uh, both at the elected level and at the staff level. This is something that's very important. And I have to say how much I appreciate uh, the leaders, the two of you and the others who have been working uh, to build this accreditation program and this registry in an intentional manner to ensure that we are being as inclusive as possible. One example of that is the pre-registry. The pre-registry is uh, a listing that ensures that people who are serious about the profession, they're serious about the role, they have received training, but haven't yet had the work experience in part because of underrepresentation in the actual work experience as this field builds. And the point of the pre-registry is to ensure that they too are able to signal to the industry that they're serious, that they're trained, that they're available, even if they haven't hit the high mark of a registry yet through their work experience. And having a high work experience is important because this is an area where if someone really doesn't know what they're doing, they can actually generate trauma and they can get in the way of a production. So we're always going to stand behind very high standards when we're building a registry or uh, an accreditation program, but we wanna make sure that there is an expanding pipeline for people who have been traditionally unrepresented or underrepresented in this industry to be able to come into uh, the role of intimacy coordinators. So very important. Also, on, uh, and I'll say this, and then if either one of you wants to add anything, please do. But with the accreditation program, the training programs that, uh, that we are looking for are those that actually have a plan to do outreach and to ensure that they are being inclusive and finding ways to bring traditionally underrepresented folks, people of color, uh, among others, right? Um, into those programs and ensuring that the training is doing its part to establish uh, the an expanded pipeline and to ensure that we've got equity and inclusion uh, throughout this process. Very important, David. I'm so glad that you were able to share that. I, I actually, um, you know, now that we're coming through this period of time when, uh, and I think members are really interested in this, we're coming through this period of time where work is starting to grow again. I mean, we're, you know, we're coming back to work. And what are you seeing as intimacy coordinators since we've had this year that's been a little bit uh, quiet in terms of the work front, but we've been doing this work. Now that work is opening up, are you seeing a shift from when before we went through the pandemic and what does that shift look like and how are you dealing with the protocols as uh, we're going through this transitional bit of going back to work? I think a lot of people thought that intimacy work might be in danger or that it wasn't gonna come back full force because performers would be concerned about COVID and things like that. But at least in my experience on set and, and that of a lot of the other ICs that I've talked to, um, intimacy is still going full force. Um, I think performers feel really safe and really comfortable with the COVID-19 protocols that have been developed and um, taken on by the industry. Um, it's just, there's just been an amazing job in terms of, you know, testing and prevention and, and contact tracing and things like that. Um, so shout out to all the COVID teams out there. And so um, intimacy has just continued to pick up as normal. And, and I think, you know, it's such an important piece of storytelling. And I'm really glad that we, we basically have been able to continue as pre-pandemic. Me too. Yeah. Right there with you, Amanda. Um, <laughs> major shout out to all of the COVID teams who have been doing amazing work. And a lot of people kept saying to us, you know, I really think maybe we won't have intimate scenes or fight scenes or anything of people getting close. But what we found was very quickly things ramped up just as before. And what we find during these times is that the conversations around consent and safety are even are, are even more important than they were before. So if anything, um, this has been a continued collaboration with just another person on set uh, and, uh, and the intimacy work has just continued to flourish. And surely will uh, just grow and grow and grow as not only the industry goes back to work, 
but uh, with these new platforms and the ever-growing desire for content and for really intimate content, content that tells specific stories that were largely unavailable when it was just primetime television. So uh, really important. You know, one question that I have received constantly, I want to make sure that I ask it. Some believe that intimacy coordinators are just for women and that men don't benefit as much or don't need the protection. I'd like you to talk about that men, women, and you may even have some uh, of your own professional experience with non-binary. Give a sense of that so that people can understand the types of protections that are provided on set. I think that I think that performers of all genders benefit from working with an intimacy coordinator. And I always think this is such an interesting question. Um, and I get asked it all the time, but I think it's such an interesting question because at the end of the day, performers are people, right? And everyone has insecurities, everyone has vulnerabilities, and it's gonna, you know, and, and the other thing is like, no matter what your gender is, you, you're going to, you're gonna have certain sensitivities, you're gonna have certain concerns about the way that your body looks. Those are just part of the human experience. And so those are things that, you know, performers will share with an intimacy coordinator, like, oh, I, I don't like this part of my body. I don't want it to be seen on camera or, oh, I really don't like it when someone touches me here or there. And so no matter what your gender, you know, there are definitely ways that you can benefit from working with an intimacy coordinator. And I, I think one of the things that I often see with people who are socialized as men is that they are really concerned about doing something that might feel violating to their partner and which is completely understandable you know in in the current environment that we that we live in and and so i think that for for a lot of men it's really helpful to be able to talk with the intimacy coordinator about those concerns because they're real concerns and so a lot of men find it really helpful to have those conversations and and we're able to reassure them that we will have conversations with your scene partner about what is it that they're okay with so that you know exactly where those boundaries are and you don't have to feel worried while you're performing about, am I doing something right now that my partner finds violating? Because we talk about all those things explicitly so that there is no guesswork when you're performing. So you can just focus on your performance and giving, giving you know the best performance possible. Love that. Tell the story, being able to tell the story freely and feeling uh, empowered. Uh, we have questions actually that are coming in from uh, members. So I'm gonna ask actually, Rebecca, you're here with us and uh, it would be great for us to go through those together. And Michelle Bennett, who did the presentation, Michelle, please also feel free to uh, answer some of these questions as we, uh, we, as we start to uh, delve into that. But um, for the first one, I guess I'd like to actually this is a question that comes up to me often from members is, um, what is the best way to request an intimacy coordinator if it, there isn't one currently on set? And that would be for either uh, Alicia or Amanda or, or Michelle can answer that. I would say as early in the process as you can, you know, if you are brought in and you know there is an intimate scene coming up, you can make that also part of your talk to your agent, talk to your manager. Um, you can make sure that that is part of the conversation that is happening when you're being brought in. Um, or once you are cast, ask, you know, is there an intimacy coordinator? How is this going to be handled? Or if it's, uh, or you can always request and say, you know, this is something that I would like to have. Um, you know, we are brought in by so many uh, productions and across the spectrum of different types of productions. However, uh, nothing is mandated right now. So um, part of empowering yourself can be for asking, uh, asking the people that you are working for, for an intimacy coordinator. Thank you. I actually believe that's one of the reasons there's more expansion of it going on and why we had to stop the wild, wild west aspect of this to really create a structure and an expectation so that it could actually not only live, but flourish uh, as a part of our industry because we want everybody to embrace it and look to it. So thank you for that. Uh, Rebecca. Uh, thank you, Gabrielle. And it's, it's good to uh, see you, Alicia and Amanda today. Um, 
uh, seeing you here today actually brought back immediately for me the uh, moment in which this conversation first walked into the SAG after room when you brought the, it to our attention to Gabrielle and myself, other officers. And I remember being at a, a WNW meeting or a wages and working conditions meeting where several performers who had done intimate scenes came to have that conversation in the room along with several SAG after members who were intimacy coordinators. So this journey to hear this conversation today is just super amazing and very exciting. But one of the questions that has come up uh, again and again and, and was asked today is, you know, if this is something that somebody is interested in possibly pursuing, what are the best first steps that they can take uh, in terms of being an intimacy coordinator? And uh, there's a little bit of a follow-up question. So I'll let you guys answer that and then I'll, I'll, I'll go to the follow-up. I think the best first step is to do a lot of research. You know, there's a lot of resources out there in terms of reading interviews or listening to podcasts or watching um, recordings of videos and things like that um, where people are talking to intimacy coordinators and learn more about the job. Um, I also think it's really good to start looking into what programs are available in whatever country you're in, um, what training programs are available, and familiarize yourself with those programs and the options that are out there. Ask questions of the programs. Find out more about the details of the experience of the trainer. Um, what is their approach to intimacy coordination work? Um, what is their level of experience with working as an intimacy coordinator? And get really familiar with um, the different training options out there. Um, and that's probably where I would recommend starting. Alicia, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think you nailed it. I, I would also say for if you are not someone who is coming from the film and, tele, a film and television background to get yourself on set. Um, there have been people that I've trained that I've said, and you know, go PA, do whatever you can, try to shadow people, do whatever you can to get on set because you know you could know a whole lot about a lot of the different things that people are trained in, but if you don't understand set culture, set etiquette, um, and how to work within a set, then uh, you have a real uphill battle. So um, getting to know this, this community and this working, uh, with the working relationships is also a huge part of it. Yeah, I, I want to second the uh, get some set experience if you come from outside of the film and TV industry, because the the rhythm of life of working on set is very different from most other jobs. And it's it's not for everyone. So that's definitely something you want to find out if this is the lifestyle for you um, before you undertake intimacy coordinator training, because it's a really big commitment. Yeah, that. That's such a great answer. And the second part of the question and why I wanted to just to get the first full answer out, the second part of the question that came in that I think is important is, uh, and I know that this has been a conversation from the very first moment that I met either one of you is the trauma informed training and all of that. How important is that piece? Because uh, I think one of the, it, it, in terms of really getting this adopted and accepted in the way that we all want to see it happen for all the sag after members and for everybody on sets protection is really making sure that people have the basis in those kinds of trainings. Can you guys expand a little bit on that? It was covered briefly in the presentation, but that is something that I've seen over and over again in the questions that people have. Sure. Um, so in terms of being trauma-informed, it's really important that an intimacy coordinator is able to recognize when a performer may be having a trauma response um, <laughs> and so, so that they can respond to um, anything that's happening on set and intervene so that it doesn't continue to escalate to a level where the performer is no longer able to do their job. And so being able to spot that really early on and intervene and support that performer is incredibly critical. It's also really important to understand trauma, understand what it looks like, um, and just have tools in your toolbox in, in order to be able to support someone and be able to have conversations with them. Because sometimes performers know, uh, they, they're very aware of, um, you know, ways in which their trauma may be brought up. They may have ways that they, um, you know, are able to handle it and they may seek the support of someone and the intimacy coordinator can be that person who supports them. But you have to have a working understanding of trauma in order to be able to do that. And 
um, you know, I wish that everyone on set was trauma informed um, and was able to act as a resource in that way. But it, that's just that's just not where we are right now. And so um, intimacy scenes in particular are a place where trauma can come up um, and often does come up for performers. And so it's really important to be able to support them in that manner. Thank you. I, that's a great uh Great questions and great answers on that one. And I think when you're talking about trauma, what comes up for me is about minors uh, because you know now it's so prevalent on television, hyperexposed work or even language or whatever. Talk to us about intimacy coordination in terms of minors. Um, and because we're not only seeing sexual acts, right? There are different things that are going on. So can you talk a little bit about that uh, relationship? Yeah, so some of, sure, some of having an intimacy coordinator there is also to help advise on scenes where you may have a, a character or an actor who is a minor, um, you know, and so some of the training is also knowing what it is that you can and cannot achieve um, with an actor of a certain age. Um, and uh, really talking about how also to achieve um, a storytelling moment um, and doing it safely, but also legally. Um, uh, oftentimes we are brought in to do, uh, uh, or at least uh, my own personal experience, I've been brought in um, uh, multiple times for kissing scenes between minors. Uh, and I believe Amanda brought it up before that. And sometimes it's the, it's the first time that uh, these actors, these, peop these people are having, um, are sharing a kiss with another person. So, uh, you know, in, in general, we have the, the bar set at if there's nudity or simulated sex, you have an intimacy coordinator. However, there's all these other scenes that we had talked about before um, earlier in the presentation that either the actor, the director, or the producer might want to request some extra assistance on. So um, with those scenes with minors, it's the, it's the same thing. They get, to, uh, a minor gets to also be advocated for. There's more conversations also with their uh, guardian as well as them, uh, just to make sure that just like anything else, we're all on the same page and they are, be, they are given the resources available to do their best work and also not have this be a traumatizing experience, but even a positive working day experience, just like anyone else would have doing an intimate scene. When you're working with minors, are you also working with their parents? Because I imagine consent comes in a lot of different forms. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I've had many a, many a, a conversation with a parent, um, but also uh, a parent and minor and also the minor on their own, just so that they're able to advocate for themselves and they're able to really get exactly what they want um, from a scene as well. Thank you. Rebecca. I, I, I remember your telling the story, uh, one of you during a, uh, one of the many meetings that we had where you were talking about a child and an adult in a scene and the adult was traumatized by having to have any sort of intimate scene uh, with a minor and that your role was to make sure that the adult was handheld and supported through that process, whereas the minor was fine, but everyone was having a hard time around that. And it, it opened my understanding as to the different ways in which intimacy actually is expressed on a set. It really comes in a wide variety of forms. David, you know what you were talking sure, about? And oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that that exact uh, situation that David, you're referencing was a pedestrian moment of just a hand patting the head of someone, but because of the implications on it, it was so much more complex and having an advocate there was really helpful for everyone. That was really important. Thank you. That's, I think it was important to know that when we are talking about uh, intimacy coordinator, and we've mentioned the hyper-exposed work, we've talked about intimate scenes, but some of it is what's going on underneath for the character and what they're portraying. And when you spoke about that touching, what it meant for that adult, because it was symbolic of a role that was not something he was comfortable with as a human being because it was predatorial. So I think that that was a very good example. Thank you for that. Uh, Rebecca, I think you had a question. Yeah, um, and this has to do a little bit just with the process. So, uh, and I'm familiar with it. So, but I but I have the question here: uh, Is there, uh, in terms of this process, uh, I think sometimes think people think that because we're all here presenting it, but obviously there was a lot of member push 
uh, behind putting this into the mix. So like, I'm grateful that members did that. But I also wanna ask Michelle, I know you did uh, multiple meetings with individual and group intimacy coordinators, obviously with our work group, our sexual harassment work group, all of those different groups in the mix. But I also, wasn't there also a survey of people that were working intimacy coordinators? And can you, uh, was that to sort of get a little information? Maybe you guys can talk a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Yeah, we actually conduct, conducted uh, several ser surveys um, in the group because we wanted to collect data so that we could better see the landscape of training and experience that currently exists. And uh, we wanted to have that information so that we could be more informed in how we build this profession and what what, st what standards we need to be at and set. Great, and thank you. And what was great, uh, you know, what uh, Michelle is talking about in terms of doing that was uh, the idea that reaching out to intimacy coordinators at all different levels or, be, you know, places within their career. There were people who were just starting in the field. People have been established for a great deal of time. And all of that information actually helped to inform the process and where we are today. And uh, it was the intimacy coordinators themselves, which was a quite a large group um, who really, they really are the ones who identified the most important things for us to make sure uh, would be included in this uh, registry and uh, accreditation. It's really their voices. We were here to actually just help facilitate a conversation based on the needs of our members and the work that has been done and where they're hoping it will go. So that I have to say, Michelle, was really uh, meaningful to be able to get the information from all different uh, groups and in different uh, periods or times of their, their development as well in this work. And I wanna say thank you. I thought it was amazing what you did. Um, Michelle's really done some some terrific work. Uh, Gabrielle, I, I know we're going to be uh, wrapping up soon. I, I do want to ask uh, a, a question about a community that's a very strong um, and active community within our membership, and that's our uh, persons with disabilities, our performers with disabilities. Let me ask, have either of you or colleagues who you've worked with worked with uh, performers with disabilities and has that, uh, how has that informed the work and what was the experience like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it informs the work because it's one, it's representation um, in the stories that we are telling, but also uh, it's making sure that that person is being advocated for on all sides of their being. Um, you know, and uh, some of this is just in the consent conversation as far as what we're seeing. And also some of this was in the storytelling conversation. So, uh, you know, there is great overlap to what anyone is bringing as far as parts of their identity to the table. Um, and there will always be intersection within that. Um, but, you know, if it's, if it's accommodations that are being made to just something that we need to be aware of, these are all things that have been brought up that, you know, once we are informed, we can have those conversations with the ADs, with the director, um, and make sure that everyone's on the same page, uh, regardless of what it is. Thank you for that. I have to say, this has been an incredible process. Everybody will be hearing more about this as we move forward, as it grows, and is it not only expands, but it successfully su expands. I believe it'll become the norm as a result for us to have it in productions as we move into the future. And I'm appreciative. I wanna say thank you for the presentation. Michelle, it was wonderful. Thank you for your work and thank you for the conversation, both to uh, Alicia and Amanda. Um, it's, it bears repeating, this is really important to our members, to the, org, uh, to the industry as a whole, and you are actually uh, changing the future um, of work for members, which is wonderful. It's ongoing work. We do it every day to create real change with tactical uh, actions, not just words, with the mission that it all has a positive and lasting impact. That is the hope for all of us. So as I said earlier, the union is taking several steps to build on the movement. And if you missed last week's discussion, A Safe Place to Report Sexual Harassment, we invite you to watch it on our YouTube channel and to subscribe for more great content. We really do want to continue to make things better for each and every one of you. So on behalf of the team here at SAG-AFTRA, we want to thank each of you for tuning in uh, for our President's Task Force on Education, Outreach, and Engagement live streams. Make sure to sign up if you haven't on the YouTube again and have a beautiful day. Thank you everybody for your participation.